My name's Mark Suster, and I run a venture capital fund called Upfront Ventures. We're based in Los Angeles, where we've been based for 25 years, but we invest internationally. And in that time, we've seen a lot of market trends expand and contract. So this talk today is gonna to come with some of that perspective. We currently manage more than 100 active portfolio companies. That gives us a very interesting vantage point to the global pandemic crisis that we all face because we're seeing many of these trends as they're happening in real time with our portfolio. But what I'd like to do before talking about the impact of the pandemic is just rewind you about six months. And I'd like to take you back to what life was like on March the 16th. I had just returned from traveling on uh, three big trips to Austin, Texas, to New York, and to San Francisco. And as I flew back to Los Angeles, I couldn't have imagined what life would be like on March the 16th. On March the 16th of 2020, my partners gathered on a Zoom call, the first ever all partner meeting we ever had remotely, as ridiculous as that sounds in September of 2020. And we believed that the markets had changed overnight and probably for good. And the kind of change that we imagined actually turned out to be very different than what actually happened. And that's partly what I'd like to talk about today. What did we think would happen on March the 16th? Well, we thought there would be uh, unprecedented unemployment, the greatest probably since the Great Depression. We thought that consumer spending would dramatically weaken. We thought that capital markets would immediately dry up. And we thought enterprise accounts and corporations would start to massively cancel contracts with technology companies and begin to consolidate vendors. In short, what we thought we were in for was dot-com 2.0. So we asked every company to consider cutting its cost base, shoring up its balance sheet, and being prepared for the long haul. Just two months in, by the middle of May, it became clear that most of our assumptions were actually wrong. And we were absorbing, and the world itself was absorbing, what the global pandemic actually meant. And I'd like to share with you some of the trends that we started to see. So first of all, of course, unemployment did skyrocket to levels never before seen. Uh, governments globally and here in the United States responded quickly and they provided liquidity, both in terms of direct payments to uh, affected employees, but also liquidity to capital markets. That meant that consumer purchasing where we expected decreases actually increase across several sectors, home, leisure wear, exercise, computing equipment, all of the stuff that you would now have expected to have happened. E-commerce itself saw a massive acceleration and most of the e-commerce companies that we are proud to be investors in were up 100% year over year. And that was not at all anticipated. There were new sectors of the market that were booming. Home delivery of food and not just restaurant takeaway meals being delivered by Postmates and others, but groceries delivered to our house. We all know that Instacart was starting to have some success in deliveries. And suddenly the entire country saw groceries delivered to their houses. Meal kits. We thought meal kits maybe were on their deathbed and all of a sudden a huge resurgence of meal kits like Blue Apron. Collaborative tools and how people work uh, together remotely, as all of you can imagine, were booming. The culture change that we started to see was a bit funny at first, and I, I'm sure you experienced that, where we all kind of laughed as we got on our first Zoom board calls or Zoom management team meetings. It was all a bit funny and strange, but it started to become a norm. So after two months, when we reconvened and said, what have we learned? 
we said to ourselves, is this just a COVID bounce or is something more fundamental happening? So let me fast forward you to July, four months after the pandemic really began. And by then it became clear that society was literally being recast in ways that would never go back to pre-COVID days. And it's interesting to think about how pervasive that change has become, how much it'll affect the future of travel, of meetings, of work habits, of purchasing, of how we entertain ourselves, even where we choose to live. And that's all changing right beneath our feet. So I'd like to share with you the changes and the trends that we see on a going forward basis. See, if you think about technology, which is where we spend our time, technology has been ushering in the future already at a pretty predictable pace. So we can already see what's coming. It just takes time for society to adapt to it. I think we all knew there was a day where we would do more meetings remotely. We all knew there was a day when we would order more of our things as a society remotely. But what COVID has done is accelerate the pace at which technology is bringing the future into the present. And it's doing it in ways that are unpredictable and that are likely to be lasting. So the first one is probably obvious to most of you, which is that Main Street retail has seen its demise, maybe not permanent demise, but mass bankruptcy of, of physical retail companies. And what has come in its place is not that consumers aren't shopping. They're just choosing to shop from direct to consumer or D to C brands directly. So we see companies in our portfolio like Parachute Home, which provides bedding and towels and uh, stuff for your dining room up more than 100% year over year with, by the way, massive cuts in marketing as consumers desire to purchase this stuff directly and online. That's been underpinned, this e-commerce trend, by the success of Shopify how it's made it super easy for consumers to buy in a uniform way. But the similar trends for people like Glossier or Goat, which is a sneakerhead marketplace, I thought, given the pandemic, who on earth is gonna be buying new sneakers? I think I've been wearing slippers at home for the last six months, but Goat also up north of 100% year over year. The second trend, which maybe is less obvious, is that food supply chains are becoming absolutely critical. It's becoming critical to consumers. You'll remember that moment at the start of the pandemic where we just didn't know how we were gonna get food to our house or how long it was gonna last. People ordered as much as they could possibly order. And then you find out that your fruit and vegetable doesn't last as long as you were expecting to. So grocers have put increasing pressure on technology companies to solve some of their supply chain problems. One example we see directly from our portfolio is called Appeal Sciences. Appeal Sciences takes molecules from the stems of plants. It takes an organic compound and creates a film that seals in moisture and prevents oxidation and gives you 30 days extra yield on fruit and vegetable. Well, suddenly every grocery chain around the world is trying to get access to technology like Appeal because they want less wastage in the grocery itself. They want consumers to have confidence in buying more product and knowing that it's gonna last longer. We have a global pressure on our food supplies, whether they be fruit and vegetable, but also meats. Uh, we saw a company called Insect based out of France, spelled with a Y, Insect instead of an eye. And what they do is use robotics and vertical farming to grow worms at industrial scale that are designed to save our fish stocks by providing a natural source of food to fish and taking 98% less 
carbon emissions than if you grew the worms in the ground. So there's this demand and the demand, it's not just consumer, it's not just grocer, but nations. So if you look at nations like Singapore or the United Arab Emirates, they are now focused on a topic called food security. Food security says, I need to make sure that I can feed my people in the future. So they want access to technology to make sure that the supply chains are not disrupted in the future. So that's the production side of food. The distribution side of food has become critical as well. We already talked about meal kits and grocery delivery and restaurant delivery. So companies like Postmates uh, and Instacart. And in this period of time, uh, Postmates itself was purchased for $2.6 billion. And overnight, we saw businesses like Uber, where most of their business was focused on moving people around. And now most of its business is focused on moving food around. And I think you're going to see the criticality of food production and distribution become more important. For restaurants themselves, about 85 to 90 percent of a restaurant business was people coming to eat inside of the four walls. And we know that that's not the future. So we will have some return to normalcy. Maybe it means you're eating outside the restaurant for a period of time, but we will never go back to a world in which restaurants take technology for granted. So companies like Chow Now, Chow Now is software to help restaurants deal directly with their customers. What we've seen with Chow Now is a growth of revenue almost 400% increase year over year. Because when your business goes from 10% takeout and delivery to 100% overnight, you can't afford not to have software tools. Now, it may go back to 30%, but it's not going back to 10. On the country level, I talked about food security. Part of what's driving food security is what Peter Zahan uh, prophesized in his book, predicted in his book called Disunited Nations, that nations would begin to unbundle, our global system would begin to unbundle. And he predicted a lot of this pre-pandemic. But in an unbundling world where you can't account for global trade and global product movement to be the same tomorrow as it was yesterday, countries have got to access technology to be able to feed their people. The third major trend that we've seen over the last six months is that people care about the density of people. We care about monitoring how people move around spaces and the proximity that they spend time with each other. And as I watched the very first football game of the NFL season, there were about 20,000 people in a stadium designed for five times that many people. You can see in real time just how important it is for organizations to be able to control how many people are in their spaces. So whether it's a warehouse, uh, a meatpacking facility, or your office building, nobody's gonna take for granted how critical those things are to operations because literally shutting down your warehouse because you have too many people in too close proximity means that even though you're selling products that are non-perishable, you might be an apparel company, you still aren't gonna be able to do business if you can't ship product to customers. If you're Amazon and your business is booming as a result of a pandemic, you still can't meet demand if you can't manage the proximity of people in your warehouse. Uh, we think that these are gonna be privacy safe, non-camera solutions. If you look at what's going on and the pushback against cameras in places like in China, like the cameras used to crack down on the Uyghurs and the movement of the Uyghurs around China. I think in the United States and in Western Europe, in Europe in general, we're going to push back against that. So we see in a company like Density, which is part of our portfolio, their bookings went up 554% in one quarter. 
not just for offices, but for warehouses, meatpacking facilities, and physical security. And we think that's going to continue to be a booming area across all sectors. Uh, I would say number four, supply chains. Supply chains are getting a lot more focused than they were before because people haven't been able to actually get new product introduced to their customers. So we know Shopify has massively changed how business ultimately deals with its end customers. But the reverse side of that, which is how do brands actually get access to their supplies and their suppliers? And a lot of that hasn't been as automated at the level you would have expected. In 2019, many of these purchases were still made through trade shows in person without using any modern technology. And again, we've seen firsthand having 100 portfolio companies. One of our companies is called New Order, and New Order focuses on that exact problem. And two quarters in a row has grown 65% uh, growth rate by introducing digital gatherings, by allowing you to have digital trade shows where you actually don't need to be together in person, and by automating the ordering process. Warehouse automation. Uh, one thing is to use products like density to track how many people you have in your warehouse. But what if your warehouse actually needs to do more with fewer people? And many companies have been investing in automation of the warehouse. That's only going to continue. We've seen it firsthand with a company called Invia Robotics. What Invia Robotics does is it solves a very specific part of the warehouse problem, which is pick and pack. So when you have products in a warehouse and you need to pick them off the shelf, pack them in a box, and then ship them to an end customer, let's say you're a th third-party logistics or 3PL company, that pick and pack requires a lot of people and a lot of people in close proximity. So people are turning to robots to handle a lot more of these functions so people don't have to work as close together. Telemedicine, another area that I don't think we're gonna look back ever again and see medicine in the same way. I think we all knew that eventually you would be able to get better advice from your doctor, more real time, using cameras, using photography, using sensors. We knew it was coming, but there are societal pressures that hold back change. So one is just the regulator. So there was so much regulation around what you could or couldn't do with telemedicine. And in a world in which a pandemic is driving change, the regulators are throwing the rule books out and saying, we need to rethink everything. Now, there's probably some negative externalities that come from that, but as a society, we will benefit. If you're a patient, let's say you're a mom with three kids and one of those is a six month old, do you really want to drag three children to a pediatrician to go in for a routine test to get height and weight and make sure your child's doing okay? Do you want to take the time that it takes, but also exposing yourself to all the other germs in that office? But the flip side of that is equally important. As doctors who were trained 20, 30 years ago, they all use technology today, but somehow it was not acceptable that they would use cameras or technology to treat patients. So by and large, they didn't. And that's changed overnight. And in an interesting way, this is not only gonna help the mom or the dad dealing with their young children or their own health or seniors' health, but it's gonna free up doctors to be more productive at lower costs and finally perhaps allow doctors to have some more freedom in their work-life balance, which we know is a problem. We think sensors are going to play a really big role uh, in remote medicine. Uh, already, I sleep every night with an Aura ring, O-U-R-A. I'm not an investor, but I sleep with it because it tells me how well I'm doing at my sleep. Am I getting REM sleep? Am I getting deep sleep? And what they found is they can also tell me my body temperature. And as a result, it's become a very good predictor for people who are going to get COVID-19 or at least come down with flus. Um, I now have on my arm, I won't show you right now, a continuous glucose monitor. I'm not diabetic. 
I actually want to understand in real time what the food I eat does to my body chemistry and continuous glucose monitors and understanding N of one, each of us as individuals have different reactions to rice, to fruit, to proteins, uh, and understanding how our bodies are impacted by that is going to be part of the future. Uh, we have an investment in a company called Nanit, N-A-N-I-T. Nanit is the most advanced baby monitor using computer vision in the market. We already can tell you height and weight and how your child's developing. We have data points that can feed into remote telemedicine practices. But the sensors can predict the physical world in ways that even humans can't. Why? They have more continuous data points. They can compare larger data sets. They're not prone to the same errors that individuals are. And so actually we can begin to predict diagnoses before they actually are apparent because we get the change day over day. Transportation is another major area that will not go back to how it was. We as societies were pushing, well, first of all, societies demanded more cars. We know con congestion is not only a real problem in our lives, uh, but we know it's also a problem uh, for global warming. But what the pandemic showed us is putting people in close proximities in subways and buses was a leading spread of uh, pandemics and of disease. So governments all across Europe right now are pushing for e-bikes and scooters. So at Bird, we've actually seen some people thought, you know, is our scooters done? Is micro mobility done? The opposite has happened. Maybe different than people expected, but in a world where you don't want people sitting on buses, you actually want them in bike lanes. And so cities are redesigning themselves to handle micro mobility. So six months in, here we are in September. What are the biggest opportunities and what are the biggest risks? And these are immediate opportunities that we at Upfront Ventures are looking out for. Number one, I've already highlighted computer vision and sensors, interpreting the physical world, whether that be cameras, microphone, laser, radar, you name it. We believe that you will interpret the physical world uh, differently and that people are going to advance this technology because they understand the immediate impact. Number two, sustainability. We've already talked a little bit about food, but sustainability is going to come more into the fore also in areas like water and medicine and supplies. Number three, climate solutions. We are funding companies actually to work on solving the fire problem that we see so acutely here in California. Um, carbon, carbon emissions. How do you reduce carbon from the atmosphere? We're seeing a lot more dollars go against that. The future of work and education. It's in front of us. We're dealing with our children in primary schools and how do we educate them? What do we do about sending kids to remote places and colleges? Is that practical in the future? What benefits? What drawbacks? How are we going to work? How are we going to train ourselves? What collaborative tools? So the future of work and education a lot of emphasis right now. Solution for seniors. How do we care for our elderly in a country where 200,000 people, predominantly older people, have died from coronaviruses? Uh, and finally, I would mention cryptocurrency because as nations have solved a lot of their problem with printing money, I think you will see a decline in how people actually trust their governments to manage their wealth that they've saved and will turn to crypto as a solution. The risks, we talked about some of these, the uncoupling of country and national arrangements. We're dealing with Brexit crisis right now as we speak. Nobody knows how that's gonna break. We have a need for resources, not just food that I mentioned, but energy, medicine, jobs. We have an aging demographics. We don't have enough young people that are gonna provide for the tax base or provide a lot of our future uh, productivity gains. We have a decline in the trust of democracy, of capitalism, being fueled by disinformation and social fanaticism like QAnon. And that will continue as nations try to control their people and as some people at the top of nations manipulate this information. So technology, it's ushering in the future. 
and it's ushering in the future more quickly than we could have imagined. This will introduce faster social change than we had anticipated. And it will cause some pain as we see this change. But with technology, we also have an unprecedented opportunity to make things better, to make society more just and more equitable. And that is the future we're all here for. Thank you.